You know, the greatest event in your life is when you get saved, Amen. bar nothing else. And uh, I remember when I was saved, and uh, one of the first things that began to take place was, how do you study the Bible? How do you read it? And I'd read it and not understand words and, and things like that. But the process began, and that's the thing. You have to begin and try to stay in that process. And before long, you begin to figure out what God's trying to say, trying to teach you for your life. And uh, not only are you saved, you know you're going to heaven one day, but he wants to work in your life right now. And so uh, that process began. And uh, I, I worked hard even when I became a pastor. I worked hard at trying to interpret scripture properly and uh, did my best. I'm always glad I did separate the body of Christ from from uh, the nation of Israel. And, uh, but in the process, though, in later years, God began to reveal to me uh, some uh, new truth in the sense of rightly dividing the scriptures and why that is so important. And uh, I, uh, I had some questions. A lot of people lately, have been they've read in the last couple of years uh, about the blood moons and some of those things. And... Uh, a lot of people raising a lot of money with it. And I want to talk about that this morning, if I could. And the title of my message is, Dispensational Understanding, Does It Really Matter? And I came across a fellow by the name of Sean Brassix, and he taught me some things that I'd like to share uh, with you this morning, if I could. Just remember, there is time past. That's Genesis up to Acts 7, until Stephen was stoned. God dealt with the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, and he loves his people, but he temporarily set them aside because they rejected him. They had rejected the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the entire Godhead, and set Israel aside temporarily. And he raised up an apostle by the name of Paul, Saul of Tarsus, and the apostle Paul. Now we are today from Paul, from uh, Acts, Middle Acts, all the way up to today, it's the but now time, uh, the dispensation of the grace of God. That's what we're in today. One day we're going to be raptured up. But God hasn't forgot his nation Israel. Uh, he will once again begin to work with them, and that's the ages to come. And so when I go to Scripture, uh, I don't uh, go denominationally, traditionally, or whatever way. I go, does he speak to the pr prophetic program with Israel? Or is it the mystery body of Christ that's for today? That's very, very important. And it just clears up so many passages. And I want to talk about that this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred. Here's how they erred. Saying now, that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Here we have a passage of scripture that shows us Hymenaeus and Philetus, they erred. And the way they erred was they mixed prophetic program to Israel and the mystery body of Christ that's for today, and they mixed it. They believed in the resurrection, but they put the rapture resurrection in the wrong timeline, and that was their mistake. And by doing that, they would say to the people, you have missed the rapture. Now, missing the rapture meant that those believers would be going then into the tribulation. That would cause some of the believers to even question if they were saved. Because Paul had said, if you're saved, you're going up in the rapture. But they missed the rapture. Does that mean I'm not saved? And that's what they were dealing with. And also what it did, it placed them then under Israel's program because they think they're going to go into the tribulation and the prophetic program that God will deal with Israel. So the prophetic program is to Israel. The mystery body of Christ is to the body of Christ for us today. Now just keep that in your mind. Another example is 
A lunar eclipse happens when the Earth's shadow casts over the moon. When a total, total lunar eclipse happens, all Earth's shadow covers the moon completely. Then as the sunlight passes through the Earth's atmosphere, it causes the moon to appear copper or red in color. Then they call it a blood moon, okay? That's when they call it a blood moon. Prophecy about blood moons have really become popular lately because of some of the books and prophetic prophecies people have claimed to make. I won't say the authors, but one book is The Four Blood Moons. Another one is The Blood Moons Decoding the Imminent Heavenly Signs and Harbinger. Those books... And then they show and try to show why theirs is correct, and they do use Scripture. They use Genesis 1.14 that says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Now the word signs there doesn't mean something miraculous but that the day and the evening separate. And it's talking about you can tell the time frame of things because of the sun and the moon and the way that operates. That's all that verse is saying right there. And then they use Joel 2.31. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Then Matthew 24.29. Immediately after the, the tribulation of those days, that should tell us something there, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And notice he goes on to say the earth, the tribes of the earth are going to mourn and so on. Then they will use Acts chapter 2 verse 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. This is Peter quoting Joel chapter 2. Then they use history to try to prove the Bible correct. They will use the history of the blood moon. For instance, there were four blood moons in 1492 and 93. That's when Spain expelled the Jews out of Spain. Then they all use 1949-1950. That's just after the rebirth of Israel. And then they'll use 1967-1968, the Six-Day War that had taken place. And they're saying something's going to happen in 2014 and 2015. So they say the four total lunar eclipse, these blood moons are a tetrad, T-E-T-R-A-D, a tetrad of blood moons. And they signify something big is going to happen. That's what they say. One says, all these lunar events happen on Jewish feast days, holy days. Usually Israel fulfilling some Bible prophecy. This would happen in 2014 and 2015, they say. But have you noticed that those 20 years, 2014 and 2015 have come and gone and Israel's enemies are still there and Jesus Christ has not returned. Amen? In their writings, they say, while no one knows, but they're going to tell us. While no one knows the mind of God, these coming events does tell us God is getting ready to change the course of human history. These are a possible connection to the imminent return of Jesus to earth. That's amazing if that would be true. But they never say it with any certainty. Despite all the publicity that we've heard, and they say we need to listen to their information, they speculate Jesus may not come. 
In other words, their information may well turn out to be worthless. And it was. Because those prophecies were not fulfilled. If, since these prophecies were unfulfilled, will they return and refund the consumer's hard-earned money wasted on these books, CDs, and videos and admit that they're false prophets? I don't think they will. One says all these signs coming together at one time are potentially the culminating signals that God is closing this chapter of human history. This could be the final curtain call before the great tribulation. They say people of earth will be watching the skies in 2014 and 2015 for possible harbingers. Uh, that means omens or indicators of the return of Jesus. It could mean this. It's, they are possible. There might be war in the Middle East, an economic collapse. And by the way, did that happen? Nope. Again, they try to get science to approve the Bible. NASA's website, they say, uncovered the startling fact that the four blood moons coincide with the Feast of Israel, the Passover and Tabernacles. In the time of A.D. 70, 1900s, and coincide with the coming lunar eclipse in 2014-15 with Israel's feast. Then they say these are patterns and Historic facts that cannot be disregarded. The Jewish Talmud records, wait a minute, Jewish Talmud. Those are the scriptures that Christ criticized. Those were rabbi sayings and quotations, not the word of God. The Jewish Talmud records that two lunar eclipses are indicators or omens for the Jewish nation of Israel. Now, I'd like to give a few answers if I could real fast. The Bible does talk about blood moons preceding and accompanying Jesus Christ's second coming to earth. That's absolutely correct. The Bible says astronomical events will usher in his return. The moon will turn as blood and the sun be darkened. It says in Matthew 24, 29 again, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. Mark says this in Mark 13. But in those days after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars of heaven shall fall. John says in Revelation chapter 6, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. And by the way, when is the sixth seal? In the tribulation, okay? That's important. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars, that will happen in the tribulation. Job chapter 2, verse 30 again. And I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and the pillars of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And then Peter says in Acts 2.20, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day the Lord come. Now, when I read all those verses, did any of you notice that these verses and these books are in the prophetic program of Israel? And they're speaking of being in the tribulation. Hello? That's why dispensational studying the Bible helps prevent us from confusing ourselves, the body of Christ that we're in, with the nation of Israel. We are not the same. Paul never instructs us to look for signs in the heavens. The only thing that the stars and the moon and the sun it shows forth the glory of God, but we don't look for God to communicate with us from that. He never instructs us to look for signs in the heavens as we wait for the pre-tribulational rapture. 
When the tribulation happens, I want you to know something, I'm gone. Amen? 1 Thessalonians 1.10 And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. We've been delivered from that wrath, that tribulation time that's going to come on the earth. Chapter 5, verse 9 says this, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, the tribulation, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. As a believer, of, member of the body of Christ, you and I, if you're saved, we on earth, we will leave this earth. We won't be here when these signs of the heavens occur. You won't be here. So what are you worried about it for? Amen? Secondly, the God of the Bible doesn't encourage us, the body of Christ, to celebrate to keep any of Israel's feast days in our dispensation of grace. There's no merit in doing them. Galatians 4, 9 says, But now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly, beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you lest I have bestowed up, uh, upon you labor in vain. What, what are you doing going back under the law and, and, and following the law things? He says in Colossians 2, 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. God tells us something very, very important. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then shall we, shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Amen? So you and I are not under the law, obligated to any of these feasts, these holy days. We have nothing to do with that. But everybody gets excited about that. It's a good money raiser. You watch TV, and they're talking about it. Hey, this is a certain day, Passover, and I'm saying, here they're trying to, to do Passover, and it's not even for us. It's for the people of Israel. We have all the revelation we need from God in the Bible. The Bible is complete. If we must look to the heavens to find a word from God, a sign or a prophecy, then that is called extra-biblical revelation. And we don't need it because we're complete in Christ and we have a complete book called the Bible. Amen? The Bible is clear. 1 Corinthians 1.22, For the Jews require a sign. Who requires signs? The Jews do. Jesus said himself in John 4, 48, Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. He says in Mark 13, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? Why are they asking them that? Jews require Sign. Jews are the great sign people. Started with Moses. Matthew 24, 3. And as he sat up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. Jews require a sign. But the Bible never says, Gentiles, the body of Christ, look for signs to learn something that God is communicating. We're different from Israel. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Faith in what God says in his word. So why are we Gentiles, we that are in the body of Christ, why are we always looking for signs? It makes no sense for us in the dispensation of grace, the body of Christ, to use Israel's verses, Israel's doctrine, Israel's programs, Israel's miracles, Israel's signs of the end times. Looking for all of that when most believers today are in the dark in what God is doing today on earth. 
And the reason they do that is they don't rightly divide the word of truth. I personally believe the blood moons were a subtle, sensational trap of Satan's. You know, when you ask people, what do you want to study? And most of the time, do you know what Christians say they want to study? Revelation. Why? Revelation is not for you. It's for the nation of Israel. Why do you want something from Israel and not something from the body of Christ? Hello? Remember, because we're in the body of Christ, our Bible is complete with what God wants us to know. We don't need signs, nor hunches, nor superstitions, nor church traditions, or best-selling books by unsure Christians who say, well, it could be. Is it possible? We are not sure, but... Huh? Remember this. The prophecies of the Bible are specific and always correct. The blood moon's hype were nothing more than that, hype. That's exactly what it was because they were not fulfilled in 2014 and 2015. Now, no doubt there were many good, sincere people trying to defend the Bible with science and history. They tried to bring those together, and they held to the blood moon's viewpoint. But since... They've come and gone and not fulfilled. It's given the critics of God the opportunity to laugh, to ridicule, and scorn at the Bible. Look at these crazy people. They've said this, nothing to happen. Like we said, it's none of it's true. And they mock us for making these false predictions. Amen? And... I think it's so important that when this happens, it causes also believers, as in 2 Timothy, it causes believers to be more confused, begin to have doubt because they don't know what's for today. Someone said this, and I love it, may we not be on the lookout for signs in the heavens, but for shams on the earth. Hello? Is that too hard? Uh, Y'all just look at me kind of funny. Uh, Know this truth. 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 and 7. Paul speaking, Now ye know what withholdeth that he, the Antichrist, might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. In other words, the Antichrist, Paul says, is being held back. The end time prophetic program, there's something that's hindering it from being revealed, from operating by being put on hold. And what is holding back the end time scenario for the nation of Israel and the world at that time, what's holding it back? And I say to you this morning very clearly, the dispensation of the grace of God, that program, the body of Christ, and believers that are indwelt by the Spirit of God, that can't happen until we leave. That's what's withholding these end-time signs. We have to keep these two programs, Israel and the body of Christ, separated. If we want to know what God is saying today, you need to learn Paul's epistles. It's just that simple. Now, we love all the Bible, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable. We love the very beginning. In the beginning, beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We know the first 11 chapters teach about the basic 
things about life, marriage, relationships, everything. We understand that. We understand beginning uh, with uh, Noah government, that government still exists today. There are wonderful truths, but all of the Bible is for us, but not all of the Bible is specifically written to us. I don't go in Israel's program and take out the, his, their, her promises for myself. That was given to the Jews. But Paul has talked about the riches that we have in the grace of God that nobody else has except those that are in the body of Christ. Amen? So we're not shortchanged. <laughs> Matter of fact, what a privilege to live in the dispensation of the grace of God. Huh? That's so important. So I just wanted to share that. And now Paul gives us, and he does discuss prophecy in his books. He, he discusses it in Romans 9 through 11. He discusses it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. But he never tells us to look for prophetic signs and events in the heavens. The reason Paul even mentions prophecy is to show us we are not a part of it. We're not a part of Israel's prophetic program. We're part of the body of Christ, the mystery program that God is revealing and to a lot more people today, I believe, before he does come back. Now, I know... A lot of people get upset with trying to take away their signs, <laughs> take away those miraculous things. But once again, I just say, walk by faith in what God's word says and not by sight, because you'll be fooled if you go by sight. All those verses we showed about signs in the heavens, they all deal with Israel. The next body event for us we're going up, the trumpet's going to sound, and we're going to meet Christ in the air, and we're going to go to heaven and be with him. Amen? That's the next thing on the calendar. And I'm looking forward. When that last soul is saved in the body of Christ, we'll be going up. The whole body of Christ will go up to meet him. Those we love, their soul and spirit's already with God, their bodies in the grave asleep, their body in the grave sleep will be raised incorruptible and meet their soul and spirit and have glorified bodies then. And we that are alive when this happens, we won't have to experience death, but we'll be caught up, but we'll be transformed automatically as we go up, given a new glorified body to be able to operate in the heavenlies. Huh? What a wonderful truth that is. That's called the rapture, the next prophetic event that's for the people of Israel will be they will be going into the wrath of God, into the uh, judgment of the tribulation time. And it's at mid-tribulation, finally, Israel will believe. He is the true Messiah, the Son of God, the one that had come that they had crucified on a cross and murdered. But they will believe him at mid-tribulation. And so they have a hope too. And I'm grateful for that. I, I, I love Israel. But the reason Israel's not on the plan today is that when Israel rejected Stephen, the, their last, when during the Gospels, they rejected God the Father, and God the Son. So God sent the other third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, down. And they offered Israel the kingdom. All they needed to do was believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the true Messiah. That's what they had to believe. And they said, no. We don't. Stephen preached a great message, and they said, no, we don't want this man to rule over us. We don't want anything. He's not the true Messiah. And it's at that time they had denied and refused the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. 
a complete rejection of the Godhead. But God still loves them. And he set them aside. He didn't just do away with them. He set them aside. And he raises up Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul. And it's this body of Christ that we're in today that is withholding them, not letting that be on the scene yet until we are completed. And one day we'll go up and then God will deal with Israel once again. We're not looking for signs and the moons and blood moons and all this stuff. You know what the church is supposed to be looking for today? It states in 1 Timothy 4.1, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Today, what we're looking for is, is it a time that there is a great apostasy that is taking place within Christianity? Is, there, is this the time that believers have been falling away from truth? That is, that is our warning. It's soon Jesus is coming. And as I look around at Christendom, and you see the falling away even in this country, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen? Father, we thank you for your truth. We know this is a little bit different today, but I just wanted to share it. And God just hoping that people will say, will see and understand that they need to get in the word. They need to learn the truth, and especially dispensational truth, because it changes the scriptures when you read them. You get a true understanding, a true interpretation. We don't have to rely on somebody spiritualizing the scripture to make it say what they want it to say. We can actually believe your word is literal and we can take it at face value. That's for us today. And I just pray that as we get in this and study that the lights would come on, illumination would happen, people's hearts would be refreshed. They would say, I can understand the word now. Thank you, Jesus. In his name we pray. And everybody said? We hope that you received a blessing from today's broadcast. We would love to have you to visit us in person Sunday at 10 a.m. in New Whiteland. You can watch us live and view past services on our website at gpnd.net. For more information, please visit our website or contact us by phone. Until next week, may God richly bless you as our prayer.